So why don't we just do as this song says, and let's just give God every praise this morning. Let me hear you sing in church, everybody. Every praise is to our God. Every word of worship with one accord. Every praise, every praise is to our God. Sing it at church. Sing hallelujah to our God. church. Oh, let's sing it, church. Oh, Lord, my God, when I in awesome wonder
when Christ shall come with shouts of acclamation and take me home what joy shall fill my heart then I shall bow in humble adoration and there proclaim my God how great thou art then sings my soul my Savior God to thee how great thou art how great thou art then sings can be seated this morning church Yeah. 
church. I'm glad we serve a risen and a living Savior. Sing it out this morning. God sent His Son. They call Him Jesus. He came to love. He'll and forgive. He lived and died. To Oh 
hear you sing, church. Grab your Bibles and turn with me to Mark chapter number five. Mark chapter number five. We just finished up last week. We finished up Mark chapter number four. And we found our disciples in a boat, in a storm, in a panic, in a bad way. Are y'all with me? Say amen. Uh, it, this, was a, this was not your ordinary storm. This was, this was a great fierce wind. Uh, it was, it was really deadly. If it hadn't have been for the Lord, they would not have made it. The Bible says the storm was so bad that the ship was filled with water and they cried out and Jesus said, peace be still say amen. amen. And we know, uh, after that it scared them. They were more afraid of the God in the boat than the storm outside the boat. Amen. And so we're going to find ourselves in Mark chapter number five, Mark chapter number five. Uh, they have arrived to the other side. They are on the eastern side of the Sea of Galilee on the Gentile side. If you look at a map of Israel and you see the Sea of Galilee, all the left side, the, the west side uh, would be J uh, Jewish territory. It's where uh, God's people were primarily, thank you, sir, uh, were primarily at. But then on the other side was a Gentile area, the Decapolis, the 10 cities uh, that were primarily Gentile. Very, very pagan uh, multitudes of religions. So this was, this was just a, a, a very occultic place who had many gods, many religions, many false gods. And Jesus's ministry has been primarily on the Jewish side, ministering to, uh, the children of Israel. But now he says, let's go to the other side. And so they come through the storm and they land on the shore and something happens. Now they just got, can you imagine the disciples uh, we just get out of the storm. We just get out of the storm. We just get through this. Now, I don't know if y'all have ever been on the ocean or not or been in a storm on the ocean, but when you get to land, you appreciate it. Are y'all with me? And so, man, we can catch our breath. Whoo, I'm glad that's over. And just as soon as they land on the shore, they're met with a monster. They're met with a monster. So let's, let's start there 
in, in Mark chapter number five, uh, in verse number one. And they came over into the other side of the sea, into the country of the Gadarenes. And when he was come out of the ship, immediately, I mean, they didn't even have time to catch their breath. Immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no man could bind him, no, not with chains. Because that he had been often bound with fetters and often bound uh, with chains, and they had been plucked asunder by him. Fetters were the, were the, the metal uh, clamps that they would put on your ankles to secure your feet. So everything they tried to tame this guy and, 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 and subdue him came to nothing. Neither could any man tame him, and always night and day he was in the mountains and in the tombs crying and cutting himself with stones. And when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshiped him and cried with a loud voice. Now, this word cried means to scream. So this is not the man speaking. It's the demon speaking through the man. Are y'all with me? Say amen. The demons inside of him are using his vocal box and speaking through him. They scream. They scream. What have we to do with thee, Jesus, thou son of the most high God? I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not. For he said unto him, this is Jesus, Come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. And he asked him, what is thy name? And he answered, my name is Legion, for we are many. Now, a Roman legion was between 4,000 and 6,000 men, so there's a great possibility there was probably four to five to 6,000 demons in this man. Imagine that. We know there was 2,000 because they went into the swine and there was 2,000 swine, but I believe there's more than that. He besought him much that he would not send them away out of the country. Now they were nigh into the mountains, a great herd of swine feeding, and all the devils besought him, saying, Send us into the swine, that we may enter into them. And forthwith Jesus gave them leave, and the unclean spirits went out and entered into the swine, and the swine ran how? Violently. That's important. That's important. They ran violently down a steep place into the sea, and there were about 2,000. And there they choked in the sea. They died. They that fed the swine fled and told it in the city and in the country. And they went out to see what it was that was done. And it came to pass when they, they came to Jesus and see him that was possessed with the devil. And he had the legion sitting clothed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. And they that saw it told them how it befell to him that was possessed with the devil and also concerning the swine. And they began, this is puzzling, they began to pray him to depart out of their coast. And when he was come into the ship, he that had been possessed with the devil prayed him that he might be with him, howbeit Jesus suffered him not, but saith unto him, Go home to thy friends and tell them how great things the Lord has done for thee, and hath had compassion on thee. And he departed and began to publish in Decapolis how great things Jesus had done for him, and all men did marvel. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, you are well aware of who's in this building, and you are well aware of what they need to hear from me. And I pray in Jesus' name, Father, that you will, through the Holy Spirit, control my mind and my thoughts and my words. Don't let me say anything I'm not supposed to, and don't let me forget anything I need to. I pray that everybody will be ministered to today through this message. I pray that we'll see how great you are and how dangerous the devil is. Father, I pray that your perfect will be done. In Jesus' name I pray. And all of God's people say it. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. My usual way of studying is to take a portion of Scripture, whatever it is that I'm going to be preaching on, and just read it over and over and over and over again, uh, just so I can get it sunk into my head what it is that I am speaking on. And I ask God to speak to me, because if I don't understand it, there's no way that I'm going to help you understand it. 
So I read it over and over and over again, and then I just, I just pray and say, God, what are, you, what are you showing me? What's coming to mind? And when I begin to read about this guy, when I begin to read about this demoniac, this demon-possessed, crazy monster, man, my mind went back to a time that I was talking with a, a, a good preacher friend of mine that was a, uh, uh, a chaplain in the Florida State Prison. Uh, uh, this, this, he was a chaplain during the time when Ted Bundy was in the prison waiting to be executed. How many of y'all remember Ted Bundy? For you younger people in here that don't remember, uh, he was a serial killer who had confessed to 30 different murders of women, and many believe that there was way more than that. But he was crazed and a lunatic, I believe personally, was demon-possessed. When I read, when I read the, the, the characteristics of this, this man in this chapter, I was told by this chaplain he would be in that prison, and they said you could hear him screaming and howling almost every night, almost every night. He took women and kidnapped them and bashed them in the head, some that he beat them to death in their sleep in their own beds. Some he took and hid, and after they were already dead, done unspeakable things to them that I can't even say in this congregation right now. Preacher, what are you saying? I believe he was demon-possessed. I believe because, and there's been so many instances uh, over the years that we see this kind of activity in this kind of situation, but this guy is not your ordinary demoniac. We know Jesus has already cast out devils. We know that we, in Mark chapter number one, that he cast a devil out of a man in the synagogue, if y'all remember, uh, but he wasn't manifest like this guy. He was hiding out in the congregation. He was kind of doing what the devil likes to do. The devil does not have horns. He does not have a fork and tail and a pitchfork. That is Hollywood's doing to try to make you think lightly of the devil. The devil is an angel of light, and he shows up Sunday morning in a gray suit. Now, I didn't see no gray suits. I hope you ain't got one on today. That... <laughs> but that's how he comes. He is very, and so in the synagogue, listen, this man blended in like everybody else. Nobody even knew that he had a demon in him, but when Jesus showed up, it draws it out of him. And the Bible said the demon in the synagogue screamed out too. What are you doing here? What do we have to do with thee? Jesus, thou son of God. But this guy, this guy was way beyond what was in the synagogue. This guy had thousands of demons in him. And I want to I wanna just kind of go section by section through this particular portion of Scripture and just see what God has to say to us. If you will, say amen. First of all, I want you to see the sad condition that the devil leaves us in, the sad condition. Look at this man's abode. I want you to look at this man's abode. The Bible says that he does not stay in houses. If you go and read, uh, it's, very, it's very good for you if you want to study the Bible. Uh, if there are other instances of the same story in the synoptic gospel, synoptic means synonymous, same. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are almost identical, not completely identical, but almost identical. Go read what Mark has to say. Go read what Luke has to say. And go read what Matthew has to say. They all said this, that he didn't live in houses, but he lived in the tombs. He lived with the dead. He was more comfortable with the dead than he was the living. The demon would drive him out of the city, drive him to the tombs. Now, you say, what is that showing us? Well, I thought about that, and it revealed, I put it in parentheses there, I, it revealed satanic purpose. Satanic purpose. What do you mean? John eight forty four. Ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. Read it with me. He was a, say it with me. He was a murderer from the beginning. John 10.10, 10, the thief cometh not but to steal, to kill, and to destroy. 
Hebrews 2.14, for as much then as ye are the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same that through death he might destroy him that had the power of, that is, preacher, what are you saying? I'm saying this, that Peter said, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, is as a roaring lion who roameth about seeking whom he may devour. What am I getting at? The devil is not to be trifled with. The devil, you, you know, you people jump and say, well, I'm going to just rebuke Satan. Really? You don't have the ability to do that. Listen, the devil is for real. Demonic power is for real. And his purpose has always been from the beginning, death, destruction, and mayhem. Everything about him is about death. Everything about him is about destruction and destroying. Now listen, if he'd have had his way with this man without God's restriction on him, he'd have done killed this man. So how do you know? Because when they went in the pigs, the first thing they did was kill the pigs. All that did was reveal their real motive. The devil's out to destroy. And I'm telling y'all this, I'm telling y'all this because I see way too many Christians who are playing games with the devil. They don't take the devil seriously. They don't take their enemy seriously. They're playing around and not, listen, they're not faithful to church. They're not prayerful enough. And they're not careful enough. And they're playing games. And when you play with fire, you're going to get burnt. I, I, I hate to even, even say this, but a comedian a comedian was making a joke, was making a joke about the crocodile guy. And he was saying, listen, you can't keep doing stuff he does. And, this guy, and he was making a joke because it was part of his routine. And everybody laughed, ha, ha, ha. That, but guess what? You can't play with fire. You can't play with the devil. Ladies and gentlemen, if you've got children in here, he wants them. And he's praying on them. And he's stalking them. He is looking for them. And just as soon as there's an open door, he will take it. Listen, this man's abode reveals the, the devil's agenda, his purpose. Then I want you to see his aggression. His aggression. This shows satanic practice. Mark 5 says that they tried multiple times to bind him, to, to subdue him, to control him. They would put him in, in, in those steel brackets on his, on his ankles and chains, and, and he would just burst the chains and break the chains with supernatural strength. Matthew, Matthew says in, verse, in chapter 8, verse 28, it says that he was exceeding fierce so that no man might pass by that way. Preacher, what are you saying? I, I, I want you to understand. You, you got to get the, the reality of this deal. He was a monster. He was a monster. He was very violent. He had supernatural strength that Satan gave him. And he was a trophy of the power of Satan. They could not bind him. They could not control him. They could not fix him. They could not chain him. And the demons drove him into the wilderness, into the tombs, and that's where he stayed. What else? Well, Dr. Luke. In Luke's account of this same story, he says this man wear no clothes. He wear no clothes in a long time. He, he had these demons a long time. You say, preacher, what does that talk about? Well, his abode revealed Satan's purpose. His aggression revealed Satan's practice, a practice of violence. And let me say this before I go on to that next one. Has anybody been paying attention? I mean, have y'all really been paying attention? I don't know whether God's just given me the ability to see this stuff or, but I, I'm telling you, I, there is such an uptick in violence in our society today. In every 
area, every avenue. I mean, from the little little bitty fellas in, in sports all the way up. The latest is this, this fight brawl that broke out with the girls' uh, ladies' basketball. And that's just a small... You say, is there anything to that? Well, the Bible says, the Bible says that as in, as in the days of Noah, in the last days, right before Jesus comes back, it's going to be like the days of Noah. And the Bible says the days of Noah were days that were filled with violence. Say, so what do you think's happening? I think with all my heart that God is slowly withdrawing his restraint. And Satan is having his way. Say, so why would he do that? Because we decided we don't want God in our business. When I say we, I'm talking about the American people. We don't want him in our schools. We don't want him in our courthouses. We don't want him in the state house. We don't want him in the White House. We don't want anything to do with God. And you know what God said? Okay. When they asked Jesus to leave, you know what he did? He left. And we've been left to our own devices. Preacher, what are you saying? It's going to get worse. Violence. This man was very violent, very aggressive, very, very dangerous. Then we see his appearance. He was naked. This, this reflects Satan's perversion. Ladies and gentlemen, nakedness has always been a perversion. Always, from the very beginning. Just as soon, if you go back to Genesis, just as soon as Adam and Eve came to the knowledge of good and evil, in other words, they understood good and they understood evil, the very first thing they did was cover up. Because there's a connection with nakedness and shame. The Bible clearly says in the Old Testament, he's describing and putting it together. He said he will uncover the shame of your nakedness. And it's always a perversion. If you see, what happened, what happened when the children of Israel, when they begin to bow down to the golden calf? They begin to celebrate. They begin to worship this false idol. And when they begin to celebrate and dance and party, guess what started coming off? Why? Because it's connected with perversion. This man's running around. He was probably a sexual deviant, a sexual pervert. Preacher, what are you saying? If we are not crazy, we need to keep our clothes on. Hello? Well, preacher, why don't we just are half naked? Well, then you're half crazy. I don't know why you're talking about this. I'll tell you why I'm talking about this. It's fixing to be 70 degrees outside. <laughs> and the first thing that happens, just as soon as that, 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 that temperature starts warming up, people want to stay tart. That, I can't even talk. <laughs> they want to start taking their clothes off. Now, what you do at your house is your business. But if you're going to come to the house of God, put some clothes on. Well, you said you don't have a dress code. Well, we do have a dress code. Christians come dressed like Christians, and lost people come dressed like lost people. That's right. Man, I don't, if they're lost, I don't care what they look like. I don't care what they, I don't care if they look like they just come out of a pub or a nightclub. I, listen, I don't care. I can turn my head. But if I had to turn my head for a member, we got issues. You know better. Hello. Keep it covered. Say it with me. And, and sadly, the worst day is Easter. Because all you ladies, y'all go to the store and buy what the devil's selling. I don't need to see nothing here or any there. Just so we're clear. Hello? Hello? Now, I know, I know, I'm psychic. I know what you ladies are going to say when you get in the car. You're going to chew your husband out. He don't ever say nothing to the men. Well, let me say this. If a man comes up here, in here with a crop, crop top and a miniskirt, I'm going to deal with him. 
I promise. So ladies, have no fear. I'm going to be equal in my aggression. Let's use some common sense. I know we're not living in a day where common sense is very common anymore. And I know there's going to be people, every time I talk about dress, people get an attitude and get mad. I shouldn't have to say this. You should be mature enough in your Christian walk and your faith to know better than to walk out your hello. That's all I got to say about that. That's all I need to say about that. He wear no clothes. He was perverted. He's in a mess. I don't believe this man, whatever it was, whatever door he opened to allow this demonic possession, I don't think he ever dreamed he'd end up where he ended up. I, 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 I've, I've seen people that's just made a mess of their lives, and the first thing they tell me, preacher, I have no idea how I got here. But here he is. Here he is. So number two, I want you to see a satanic confrontation. A sad condition. A satanic confrontation. Look at the demons. Look at the demons. Willie G, is there a tissue over there? Not yours either. I, I, I don't if we got one. Are there some over one? Here, I'll get it if it's on this side. <clears throat> Every time I start preaching, my nose starts running. You got some? Oh, okay. You are the man. I don't care what Deanna says. Deanna's over shaking her head. Look here. These demons. Now, now keep in mind, nobody will go around this area because they're dangerous. Okay? Everybody is skipping this area of the country. Except, except Jesus. Preacher, what do you mean? I'm saying this. When everybody else thinks you're too far gone, that's when he shows up. He gets out the boat. See, he knows what's fixing to happen. These disciples, they're like, whoo, I'm, I'm so glad to get out of that storm. I'm so glad. Man, we can take a breath now. And all of a sudden, here comes running down the hill. Wow! They're, they're just like losing their minds. This demon in him, demons, and the word cry means, remember what I said, it means scream. So what is he doing? He's sitting on this hill on this cliff because the, the tombs were in the cliffs, and he was looking, and he sees some new victims. They're getting out of the boat, and there's multitude of them. So he's screaming. He's coming down to destroy. Y'all with me? So you got to use your imagination. If you don't use your imagination, you're not going to get this whole thing. So here this maniac, a naked, crazy, dirty, been exposed to the elements for a long time, is running down the hill screaming until he saw him. And he recognized him. Whoa! It's Jesus! Are y'all with me? And you know what happened? When he recognized him, there's a response. The Bible says he fell down and worshipped him. Now, the worship that he's doing is not what we just did a while ago. Are y'all with me? It means to fall prostrate. It means he would run and scream, ah! and he sees this Jesus, recognizes Jesus, he just falls down. He's laying prostrate before him in a submissive manner. It reminded me so much. I was reading this. I'm like, good gracious. How many of y'all remember when there was a pond back here in that parking lot? We turned that, we dug that pond out and drained that pond, and that whole bottom part down there used to be a pond. 
Well, when we were digging that out, a bunch of the church members came out. We were sitting there. It was a sight to see. You know, we was watching, having a big time. bunch of church members. Well, there was a little dog. I think it was Phil y'all. I can't, I can't prove it, but I think it was Phil y'all. It was a little dog, but it was a, a, a terrorizing everybody. On the other side, on, do you ever have a terrorizing dog, Phil? Y'all could be, huh? Terrorizing, barking at everybody, biting at everything. I mean, just everywhere. And I'm like, look at that thing. Well, my dad pulls up. He's in his, he's in his minivan. Well, at the time, my dad had a 70-pound bulldog named Buddy. Well, here that dog is over there terrorizing everything. And my dad pulls up on the hill. We're on the hill on the other side of the pond. And, and out comes my dad and out comes Buddy. Well, Buddy walks around in front of the van, pranced around. Well, that little terrorizing little maniac dog saw him. And all he saw was well, there's a dog. And here he come. <laughs> Until he got about 10 foot from Buddy. It was in that moment that he realized he's 70 pounds. <laughs> God is my witness. I saw it coming. I saw it coming. I said, oh, dear God, what's going to happen here? And yeah, 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 yeah. he said, hmm. <laughs> he got right there, buddy, and just flopped over on his back, four feet in there like, please don't eat me. He came meaning business till he recognized who it was. That's exactly what this demon did. He come to maim. He came to destroy. He came to, are y'all with me? Kill, steal, and destroy. But Jesus was there. And he fell down and said, what are you doing here? Now, this is an amazing thing. This is an amazing thing. When you read Matthew's account, Matthew said, and by the way, there was two of them. It's not said in Mark, but if you go back and read in Matthew, you'll find out there was two of them. And there was two of them that ran down. Now, now the other two gospels don't say much about the other one. I think it's because once he was healed, he just left. But this man stayed with Jesus, and, and, and we'll see that in a minute. But either way, it says this, it says this, that when this demoniac got to Jesus, these demons, this was the question they asked. This was their request. Are you here before the time? And think about that. So what does that mean? Do you realize them demons know the Bible better than you do? They know they know there is going to come a time when God is going to bind them and cast them into the pit. They know that their days are numbered. They know that, listen, it's all coming to a head, but they did know this. It's too early. In other words, they are questioning Jesus and saying, what are you doing here already? And Jesus knows it's not time yet. That's why he allowed them to go into the swine. You see this, watch this, watch this. We see their recognition. They recognized Jesus. They responded. They fell down in fear. And they requested him, please don't send us to the pit. You see, there's a place right now. There's a place right now. According to Scripture, there's a place right now that God is holding certain demonic angels, fallen angels, in the pit because of their behavior in Genesis. I believe it's specifically chapter 6. And they'll never get out. They're bound there. And that is the very place that these demons were afraid that Jesus was going to send them. And so they beg him, please don't send us to the pit. What are you doing here already? What are you doing here before the time? Please don't send us. They say, notice the, the pigs. Send us in them pigs. Can we at least just go? I know we got to go out this man, but send us to the pigs. And Jesus said, go. Go. Now, that's the demons. Now, look at the deliverer. Look at the deliverer in this confrontation. I want you to see his authority. 
He didn't say, would y'all mind coming out this guy? Did y'all notice that? He didn't say, if you don't care, would it be all right if? Jesus never talked in them terms. Never talked in them terms. What did he say? Come out. What are you saying? He spoke with authority. Look what it says. They even recognize it. They even recognize it. In Mark chapter number one, when he cast the demon out of the man in the synagogue, this is what they said, Mark 1, 27. They were all amazed insomuch that they questioned among themselves saying, what thing is this? What new doctrine is this? For with, everybody say it, for with authority. He commandeth even the unclean spirits and they do obey him. He taught with authority. He spoke with authority. It was said never a man spake like this man. He cast demons out with authority. He healed diseases with authority. He calmed the wind and the waves, all of nature with authority. And he's showing his authority with these multitudes of demons. Preacher, what are you saying? I'm saying there's no problem in your life that he don't have authority over. The Bible says he was manifested that he might come to destroy the works of the devil. Preacher, what are you saying? I'm saying if the devil's working in your life, he came to destroy them works. I'm so glad he come to the other side for me. He was a Gentile. But Jesus came to the other side. He left all of those Jews for that one Gentile. What does the Bible say? The shepherd left the 90 and 9. Are y'all thankful? Now, let's continue. We see his authority, his ability. They did what he said immediately. There's no problem too big for him to solve. But, but this, is the, this is the most puzzling thing I think I've ever read in Scripture, and I think I understand it now. The people feeding the pigs, it just scared them. To, you can imagine. You can imagine. You imagine out there watching your hogs, and then all of a sudden they started squealing and screaming and running crazy and violently run down into the sea and die. I heard a preacher call it, it was suicide. Come on now. You know that's funny. I wasn't going to say it, but it was too funny. I thought it was hilarious. I mean, they just, they just went crazy and run to the sea and die. Man, it scared them to death. They ran to town, said, y'all got to come and see what happened. Y'all got to come see what happened. Man, the craziest thing happened. And here all the town comes. But when they got there, they recognize the crazy man. You don't fight over and over with this guy trying to chain him. You, you, everybody recognized him, but he wasn't the same. The Bible says he was seated. He wasn't running around the tombs. He was clothed. Hello. That's the sign right there. Seated, clothed, and in his right mind talking to Jesus. Can you imagine as the town people come up, he just looks like, hey, fellas. <laughs> and then this is the crazy part. He looks at the town people and looks at Jesus and said, he did it. It was him. It was him. Now, this is the craziest thing. I'm telling you, this is, this is the most eye-opening thing about society. They look at Jesus, and there was no gratitude whatsoever. Can you imagine? I, 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 got, I can't help but I, I just, in my mind, I, I think I would have 
run up to him and said, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. This guy was a nut. He was crazy. Anyway, it was all we could do. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Matter of fact, I got some more back in town. Do I have a witness? Can you imagine the relief? And, 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 and man, what a, what a blessing that was that this one that you've tried to fix for all these years, he finally got fixed. Man, you, you would think they'd roll the red carpet out, give him the key to the city. But you know what they did? They said, you got to go. First it said they were greatly afraid. They were afraid. Now, this is not an unusual response. Because how many y'all, how many y'all remember when, when, when Peter was in the boat with Jesus, Peter was in the boat with Jesus, and, and, or actually Jesus got in the boat with Peter and said, hey, cast off a little while. They fished all night, caught nothing, was washing their nets. Jesus had a sermon to preach. And so he said, hey, you mind if I get in your boat and, and push off a little bit and I can teach this message? And so he taught and he told Peter, cast out into the deep. Y'all remember that? He said, put your nets out. I promise you, you're going to catch a bunch. Peter said, man, look, we done fished all night long. We ain't caught anything, but if you say so. King James, nevertheless, at thy word, if you say so, drop the net, all the fish, y'all know what happened. What did Peter's, what was Peter's response? He said, depart from me, for I am a sinful man. When you come to the realization that you're in the boat with the holy, when Jesus manifests his holiness, all we can see is our sinfulness. What happened with the disciples in the, in the ship in chapter 4? We just read it last week. He walks to the bow of the ship. They're in this great, major, mighty storm, and he says, peace, be still. He tells the wind and rebukes the wind, and he calms the, the, the waves. And, and the Bible says that these disciples who were afraid of dying are now even greatly more afraid of the one in the boat with them, the God in the boat with them, than the storm in the air. What manner of man is this? What kind of man is this? It's the same response that these people have. You say, preacher, what happened? They were ungrateful and they were uncomfortable in his presence. What happened? I believe, I believe that this verse says it all. <clears throat> in John chapter 3, verse 17. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten son of God. This is the condemnation that light is come into the world and men love darkness rather than light. Say it with me. Why? Because. Preacher, what do you say happened? I used to think. I used to think that they were worried about the economy. Listen, if Jesus stays around here, it's going to hurt our economy, man. They're going to kill 2,000 of our pigs. But I don't think it was that. I think they were deep in their pagan cultish religion. And when they came in the presence of holy, they were uncomfortable they didn't like it because when you shine the light, you can see the cockroaches. You can be, you can be looking through your windshield and doing fine and everything looks good till a, a car comes and the light shines. And guess what you see? How dirty it really is. You say, what happens when God shows up? Your sin shows up. Your sin is revealed. And see, they, this is such an amazing thing that they were more comfortable in the presence of a demoniac than they were a holy God. They said, you've got to go. You can't stay here. You've got to go. Why? 
because sin cannot stay in the presence of the holy. And they love their sin. They would rather stay in darkness. They would rather stay in the condition they were in than to change their life and repent. Men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were. Make no mistake about it, ladies and gentlemen. Everybody look at me too and listen up real good. I've heard heard this my whole life. Well, the world hates Christians because they're hypocrites. That's not true. There's hypocrites at Walmart and McDonald's and Burger King and the ball game and the ball field, and the gym, and they don't stop going there. has nothing to do with hypocrites. Let me tell you what it has to do. What is in you? They hate what is in you. Now, do some Christians act like hypocrites? They sure do, and I wish they'd stop. Does that hurt the name of Christ? Absolutely it does. But that's not why they hate Christianity. That's not why they hate Christians. That's not why they say only God can judge me. The only reason some idiot would say only God can judge me because he don't believe God's going to judge him. If you really believe that, you wouldn't be foolish enough to say that. Because God is going to judge you. And they had, listen, the heart is so depraved that it would rather deal with with a monster than to deal with their own sins. Let me say this while I'm here. Quit making excuses for your sin. Just confess it and repent it. And let God help you with it. As long as you keep blaming it on somebody else, Well, it's this and it's that. I was raised this way. I was raised that way. This happened to me. That happened to me. Listen, there's a lot of people that was raised like you was raised. There's a lot of people that had things happen to them, same things that happened to you. But guess what? We're accountable to our own sin. Don't tell Jesus to go. Because guess what? He will. Read it. When they said, you've got to leave, you know what he did? He's not going to force himself on anybody. But one old boy in this story. We know there were two. I believe two of them were healed. But I think, I I, I can't prove this, can't be dogmatic about it, but because this has happened to other times in Jesus' ministry that a lot of times they're, they're so caught up in the healing They forgot to appreciate the healer. And I believe the one after he was healed and the demon was cast out, he just took off because he was happy to be free. But the problem with that is, the problem with that is, if you cast a demon out, the house is clean. If you don't replace it with something, he'll go bring more and come back. But I believe this old boy, he had sat with Jesus, and Jesus had helped him, and I believe he's now a disciple of Christ. And when Jesus went to leave, he said, let me go, let me go, please let me go with you. He said, no, he said, no, I got something for you to do. I got something for you to do. I want you to write these two things down on that last point and then look at me. Don't put nothing away. Don't put your pen down. I may say something fantastic. (laughs) We never know. It could happen. He gave him two things, a mission in a message, a mission in a message. What did he say? Now, now this is so good. Do y'all realize, do y'all realize that this is the very first missionary that Jesus ever sent out? He never went to seminary. Never went to Bible college. He didn't have all the training that the, the disciples already had. He said, let me go with you. Nope, nope, nope. I need you to go home. And tell. So what was his mission? Go and say it with me. Go and say, what was his message? What was he going to tell? What good things the Lord had done for thee. Amen. Now, I don't know about you, 
But that one portion of Scripture right there has removed all of our excuses. Preacher, I just can't go witness. I've not had any training. You know what training he had? None. Well, I don't know if they could use my testimony. You know what his testimony was? Hey, I used to run. I used to run around naked and I was crazy. Let me tell you about Jesus. We all got a story. If God's done something for you and God's been good to you, go tell somebody. How dare we? How dare we? Walk by that table out there. A bunch of y'all did last week. And we've got these invite cards. Are you telling me you don't have any family, two of them that you could put in this line, any friends, any neighbors or others that you could come up with to tell what God's done for you? How could we not? You know what? You know what this old boy did? He said, okay. Son, he struck out that boat and went to that, the, the, the copolis, those 10 cities, went around telling everybody. They was all amazed. Well, I don't know if it, I don't know if it made any impact. Oh, it did. If you keep reading, I think it's in chapter 7, Jesus makes a visit back there. Now, keep in mind, he had never been there. He was only there for a few minutes, and that was to heal this demoniac. But when he went back, the Bible says when he landed on the shore, they all flocked to him, bringing all kind of people. Now, why do you reckon they did that? I wonder, could it be? They was this closed, sane man running around telling everybody, say, let me tell you what God did for me. Are y'all with me? Say amen. Preacher, you don't know what kind of mess my life is. It probably ain't as bad as that guy. If God can change his life, God can change your life. Watch this. If God could use that messed up dude, God could use you. And all God's people say it. Let's pray.